All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our third week of our virtual Chautauqua program. Uh, my name is Stephanie Boyle, and I'm a program officer at Maryland Humanities. Maryland, uh, Maryland Humanities creates and supports educational experiences in the humanities that inspire all Marylanders to embrace lifelong learning, exchange ideas openly, and enrich their communities. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to be joined here by Sherry Tolliver. Hopefully you, will, uh, you joined us earlier for a live stream of her performance as Mary Church Terrell. So Sherry, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and turn on your camera. Hello. Hi, Sherry. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My pleasure. Uh, so for those who, of you who are joining us live, you can leave your uh, questions um, for Sherry to answer. We, uh, if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A section, or if you are on Facebook Live, you can leave the, the comments um, in the section, in the comment section. You can leave your questions, excuse me, in the comment section below. Um, and we look forward to having um, a discussion over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, so Sherry, I just wanted to start off by asking you what inspired you to play Mary Church Terrell? Okay. Um, <laughs> I think the first time I saw her photograph, um, where she's sitting in this beautiful car chair and she has this uh, elaborate white lace dress on and she's got her finger this way. Some of you may have seen that photograph. I was just so struck by her, 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 oh, what is the word? I had it at the tip of my tongue. Uh, she was just so elegant and so beautiful. And then when I read uh, the article about her and all she had accomplished, I thought, you know, they always say that the a woman that has beauty, brains, and talent, like that's some kind of rare occurrence. And I'm like, here this woman was 100 years ago. And I'm sure she has, as I learned about her, hundreds of friends who were equally beautiful, talented, and uh, beauty brains and talent. Um, so I was just struck by her manner, her regal, uh, just her, her, her sense of herself was so obvious in that picture. And then when I learned about her, her being able to speak three languages and, and um, all her accomplishments, educating, journalism, music. She just just bowled me over. And I thought, so few people know that African-American women were accomplishing these things in the 1800s, let alone now. It's still, people are shocked to find out uh, that women have these accomplishments, especially African-American women. So I said, I want to do her story. I think she's a fury. I wanted to write a story called Four Furies, and she was one of them. And uh, as fate would have it, I found a group called Women in History in Lakewood, Ohio, who did first person characterizations of women who weren't known mostly in history. And I said, Eureka, this is perfect. This is just what I need. I need a forum to bring these women to life and share their stories. So that's, that's that story. Thank you. And as you begin your performance, you um, you discussed in there that that you know Terrell is working on her own autobiography, A Colored Woman in a White World. Can you talk to us as you were developing the script for this? You know, what primary sources did you look to? Did you look towards her autobiography? I imagine oh. that's the case. Oh yes. Can you share a little bit more about uh, what you used. You have it right there. <laughs> what did yes. You as you were creating this story and, and how did you decide what snippets because we really see the performance as these like snippets of her yes. life yes um that's partly because how do you tell someone's story who was active and and engaged and participating in the full arena of life for 60 years um more than 60 because she died at, at 90. um i I started researching, uh, uh, my mother had a collection of books. My mother had a black history bookstore 
Uh, actually, when she first opened it, it was a Negro history bookstore because it was the early 60s and we still use that term. And ironically, um, Mary Church Terrell wrote an essay where she said, please stop using the word Negro because she didn't approve of that word. But that's a whole nother conversation. Um, anyway, I read about her in that book. And uh, uh, I just, I from a young age, because my mother had those books, um, Black history has always been a part of my education and my passion. And so I would do reports on them in school. And so I fell in love with the library and I fell in love with books. So the first place I went was the magnificent Cleveland Public Library, uh, where I found her autobiography, where I found uh, the um, research done by the amazing Darlene Clark Hine, who's done an entire encyclopedia of Black women's history. Uh, it's several different versions of it. Um, and so she had one whole uh, volume of her encyclopedia devoted to Mary Church Terrell. And so I got that. And the librarians uh, knew how serious I was. So even though it was a reference book, they let me take it out. Um, and then uh, last summer, I had the privilege of actually performing at the Library of Congress as Mary Church Terrell. And so uh, her whole, uh, they have a whole, her papers online. So I used her actual papers uh, online from the Library of Congress and um, the Oberlin Library. She's an alumni of Oberlin. Well, they recently renamed the library, the Mary Church Terrell Library. And so I took a drive down there from Cleveland and spent some time uh, actually getting to hold some of the things that she wrote and looked at uh, her collection. And it was just marvelous. Uh, um, I couldn't have done this work without the library. And I, I always give a shout out to librarians because they make, um, I have such a passion for this that I would be penniless if I spent all my money on the book. So fortunately you get to do it online and now you get to do it uh, online. When I first started, you had to go to the library, get the books and either photocopy them or take notes by hand. And my uh, original notes are all in hand. Cause that's how I'm old school. I write things by, you know, on paper. So it was very hard, since we were talking about suffrage, uh, I focused mostly on her suffrage work, but her life uh, is, is just so filled of uh, accomplishments. There's a new biography coming out about her called Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell, and that's by uh, Allison Parker, who's a professor at University of Delaware, and that's the first comprehensive biography of her that's being published, and that's coming out in the fall. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Thank you. And, and you touched on this throughout you know, the answer you just gave, um, but we have a lot of questions uh, in the Q&A about, um, about her education. So I'm gonna ask this question from um, Melinda on Zoom. She said, could you go over where she was educated as a child? Did she attend the same boarding school from age six through high school? Um, when when did she move on to college? Um, okay. Did she have any siblings, and did uh, and did they attend boarding school? Yikes! <laughs> okay. I can go over them one at a time. So talk a little bit about her early education. All right. Yes, her parents did not want her to attend the segregated schools in Memphis where she was born. So they sent her to Yellow Springs, Ohio, where Antioch College had um, what they called a laboratory school, I think, um, for children. And so she stayed with a white family, I believe. I, I'm not sure, she didn't really say. She said the family was, there was only a few colored families in the, in the neighborhood. Um, most of her neighbors were German. So she learned how to speak German and then her mother had her tutored in German. But she went to that laboratory school until the, I think she was 12. And then one of her teachers suggested that she go to Oberlin College and move to Oberlin and go to Oberlin Public School uh, for junior high school and high school. And so that's where she went to junior high school, and high school, and then she went to college there and graduated from there in 1884. She did have a brother. Uh, he, her parents divorced when she was very young. So her mother got custody of both of them, but they sent her to school at Yellow Springs. They did not send him her, she, he stayed with his mother. So I'm not sure what his education was. She didn't really mention it in her in her autobiography, um, I know that he was educated and that he, um, uh, um, I think he worked uh, as in the treasury or some government civil service job. 
So he was educated and was successful. Um, I, no, what was the other part of that? <laughs> I'll segue into another question a few okay. people asked as well, which is, um, you know, you, you talk about how she is, you know, descendant from her, her, both of her parents being enslaved. Yes. And, you know, did you learn anything about um, how they gained their education or their logic behind the emphasis on, uh, on Mary's education? Uh, good question. Um, well, her father actually was the son of his mother's owner. So his mother was a slave and his father was her owner. And that was an unfortunate common occurrence in slavery, uh, which he speaks of a great deal. I'm, I want to touch on that later. Um, and he, he did not put him to work so much as he allowed him to learn how he became a ship steward. So he allowed him to work, but he didn't educate him. But Robert taught himself to read, the father. Um, the mother, again, she says that, um, that her mistress taught her to read and taught her to speak French and uh, um, was, was very kind to her and gave her a nice wedding. And so she did not endure um, what we typically think of as a master-slave relationship. Um, she, but in no way did Mary Church Terrell say, see, my mother didn't have it so bad, so it wasn't that bad. Because uh, her grandmother uh, would tell her the horrors of slavery and how she was beaten. And so she knew that it was real and um, that, uh, that um, it was a, it, she was very blessed to have been born in 1863 when it was over. Yeah, so to build on that, I, I think it's really powerful in your performance where you, where you mentioned that she was born one year and one day after the mm -hmm. Emancipation Proclamation. How did that shape her worldview and how did it influence, you know, who, who she becomes? Uh, I, I, was very, I was very moved by how she talked about that in her book. She says when she first found out that uh, African Americans had been enslaved, it was a blow to her and she felt ashamed and hurt and um, uh, just wounded. And then she said she realized that um, every group of people on the planet had at one time been enslaved or enslaved someone else and that she had no reason to be ashamed because that was, that was part of human history. Slavery was something that had happened in every society and it wasn't unique to her. And also, she said that she realized that uh, her people should not, could not be blamed for what happened to them. And she was proud of everything that they had accomplished once slavery was over and, and how they had endured slavery and fought against it by uh, um, being abolitionists and running away and, and advocating for freedom before the Civil War. So uh, she said that she, after that, she never felt ashamed or embarrassed about it and uh, that it was just a part of history. But she also was very adamant about saying she would never allow anyone to belittle her race and never allow anyone to besmirch, uh, especially black women. Uh, she was very adamant about that. She said I she would always stand up and defend and say, we have done noble things, we have accomplished noble things, and we're human beings worthy of respect and dignity. Thank you. Um, you discussed the club movement in your performance and uh, Terrell's involvement in that. Um, you know, we know that she was one of the founding members of the NAACP, and she eventually goes on to be the first president of the, Na of the National Association uh, for Colored Women's Club. Um, can you talk to us about the legacy those clubs had and how they impacted Black communities? Absolutely. Um, well, the National Association for Colored Women started first. That was in 1896, I think. And um, again, going back to what I said, what motivated the beginning of that group was there was a journalist uh, in, uh, in Maryland when Ida B. Wells wrote about um, lynching, his response was that um, black people were criminals, that, that black women had no virtue, and all of them were prostitutes and thieves and murderers and rapists. And 
black women across the country were outraged and they came together and said, we are going to organize and defend our sex and our race against this, um, this heinous, um, these heinous accusations and, and uh, libel, li you know, this, this hate speech is what it was, um, denigrating black people and black women in particular. And so women had already been organizing uh, in churches and uh, in the abolitionist movement as, and then during the Civil War, uh, women have always organized and, and contributed. But this, they decided to make it a national movement because uh, lynching was a problem, segregation after Reconstruction was, was getting worse and worse. And they said, we, we need to come together and, and do what we can as educated women for our people. So they started kindergartens, they started old folks homes, uh, they started um, training centers for, for girls to learn domestic science and secretarial work because they wanted to say, we, are, we can take care of ourselves. We are prepared to go out in the world and do whatever work there is. You have no excuse for not hiring us. You have no excuse for not respecting us. And some of those institutions are still in existence. Uh, in Cleveland, where I live, um, a woman named Jane Nada Hunter, um, seeing how Black girls were coming up during the Great Migration to the city, and even though it was Cleveland, Ohio, in the North, everything was segregated, started the Phyllis Wheatley Association for young African-American women to live, to get job training, to get um, employment that was decent, because many times employers would take advantage of these young girls. And she, that institution is over 100 years old now. It's still the building that they built during the Depression is still there. It's a national landmark. And my mother actually lived there before she got married and was on the board um, to, they were doing the same work. They were going out and finding uh, children in the, in the um, projects that needed, that didn't have exposure to nature and they would take them out to camp for a week uh, and, and that was all paid for by the Phyllis Wheatley Association. The women got together and, and made an agreement with the camp. So just things like that um, are still going on. And the National Association for Colored Women still exists. Um, it's not as prominent as it was, um, but it still exists. And then as far as the National Association for Colored People, the NAACP, they have been uh, at the vanguard of, of of um, the civil rights struggle by using the courts, by using direct action, uh, boycotting, uh, uh, sit-ins, um, but and mostly, uh, mostly through the courts. Uh, and uh, when it was started, um, it, it, there again, it was um, a response to the race riots um, in Springfield and in other cities. And white and black, well, white and black uh, intellectuals got together and said, we need to address the fact that racism is getting worse in America. And so they came together to organize to promote equality and in the courts, equality, uh, and recognize that lynching was, uh, was a scourge on the country and it was, the government was not addressing it. it they were justifying it or turning a blind eye to it. And uh, they're still on the, you know, they're still on the, at the forefront of the uh, civil rights movement at this time. We just lost uh, John Lewis and uh, Elijah Cummings, both who uh, were members of the NAACP. Yes, thank you. Um... And I, while we were talking, I, I shared the image you had there of the um, NAACP founders, founders for our yes. audience. Yes. Um, so uh, another uh, audience participant question here that um, I think, uh, so, so we discussed how she is coming out of this club movement and, and helping to found these organizations and you talking your performance, how that segues into her relation with the suffrage movement. Um, and so we have a question. Um, we have a question from Megan on Zoom and she wanted to know what was Mary Church Terrell's involvement with Alice Paul? Um, last week we had Alice Paul mm -hmm. for our performance. I know you, you uh, were yeah. a participant that week, Sherry. So do you want to talk a little bit about their relationship? Yeah, it, 
was um, Mary Church Terrell considered herself to be like a liaison between the black community and the white community. Um, and she tread a very delicate line because the National um, uh, American Suffrage Women's Association, I think I said that right, I always garble that, National, uh, it, NASA, <laughs> Um, was segregated uh, after after the Civil War when the the black man black men got the right to vote. The suffrage movement was outraged because uh, because they felt that everybody should have gotten the right to vote, not just black men. And so, unfortunately, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and and, and uh, some others in an effort to get white women on board with voting, because a lot of women didn't want to vote. They didn't think it was important. And so for them to make the case for, for women's suffrage, they had to, to in, in, in spite of the fact that they had been working side by side with African-Americans all through the abolitionist movement and saying that slavery was wrong and that African-Americans should have rights, it was, their focus was so, um, intent on having women get the vote that they decided, okay, well, we'll just have to cut our losses with black community and try to get white women on board with this so that we can get the amendment passed. And then they can figure that out for themselves. And um, some really uh, ugly things happened, especially uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, not so much Susan B. Anthony, but they, she kind of turned a blind eye to what they were doing. They, they kind they, they actually did reinforce some of the negative stereotypes of black men being rapists and not being intelligent enough to vote and black women not being cultured enough to vote. It, would, it should be for educated people. And she, Mary Church Terrell was very diplomatic. And so she, instead of uh, being outraged about this, she, she presented herself and said, look at me, don't I deserve the same thing you do? And she made a wonderful speech called The Progress of Colored Women in front of the National Association of so Women's Suffrage in America and, and told how, how she was born, she could have been born a slave, but she just narrowly missed that. And that while they're saying that women didn't have rights, black women didn't even have rights to their own lives they were slaves, they were enslaved. And so in, in the time between slavery ending and then, they had gone, to, they had become educated, they'd become uh, teachers, business women, community leaders, uh, and achieved all these uh, amazing things in a short amount of time. And that proved that they were just as worthy of having the vote as anyone else. And she said that, um, you know, you, you at this meeting, you're saying that you want to pass a, a, um, um, a, make a statement saying that there shouldn't be animal cruelty. She said, I want, you're standing up for animals. I want you to stand up for my sisters of the darker race. If you need the vote, we need it even more. And so she advocated for them and she was able to do this. She was like the one black person that they interacted with, but Alice Paul, uh, when the when the uh, the uh, march was organized, they all agreed that it should be segregated, and they didn't want any black participants again again because they didn't want to uh, um, uh, upset the women of the South, and so uh, the compromise was that the black women would march at the march at the end, uh, and which was no compromise. Um, but uh, she, she said that, you know, I don't know why they think they have to be at the march anyway, basically is what her comment was. Why do they even want to be in it? Um, and so there was a real disconnect because of race and just, I guess you could say tone deaf of not saying if you need it, what makes you think we don't? So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, and um, you know, I, I think, the way Terrell portrays it is just is really fascinating for all the reasons you said, you know, if, if white women need the vote, then of, of 
pores, African American mm -hmm. women need it just as much, if not more. And um, thank you for highlighting that. It, it does transition me into an, another topic. Um, dis despite sort of being somewhat disenfranchised from the um, suffrage movement, Terrell and many others organized in really amazing ways around suffrage. Um, can you talk about the Delta Sigma, you talk about the Delta Sigma Theta sorority of which yeah. Terrell was a, an honorary member of and how are historically black sororities part of this movement? And I'm gonna go ahead and share an image while you, um, while you okay. discuss the, the involvement of black sororities in the suffrage movement. Okay. I discovered something really interesting about that. Um, the first African-American uh, female soror sorority was um, the Alpha, Kappa Alpha, and they started at, at Howard University. And um, they wrote a letter to Alice Paul and asked her if they could participate in the march, but they did not want to march at the end. They said, we want to fully participate in the march uh, in, uh, in 1913 uh, in Washington. And they didn't get a response. And so they didn't march. The Deltas were started in 1913. I think they grew out of the Alphas. And they decided they were going to march. And that even though it was insulting and diminishing to march at the end, they felt it was more important to be represented than to not be there. And so, uh, um, uh, Mary Church Terrell uh, was an honorary member, and uh, I think 20 years later, she actually wrote the Delta Pledge and, uh, and helped them put together uh, their of rules and laws of how they were going to conduct themselves as, as proper colored women. <laughs> um, so, but but uh, those were the only two sororities at that time, and I, I, I think it is interesting that the uh, one group decided, well, if you're not going to invite us to participate fully, then we don't want to at all. And the other one said, well, this isn't what we want, but something is better than nothing. And that's politics. That's politics. Sometimes you have to draw a line and say no, and sometimes you have to compromise. Thank you. So, you know, we, we've I think Terrell is such an interesting person to look at because she really has this large range of, of her experiences. Yes, I mean, to yes. imagine her life and, and how she started her younger years to the time she passed away, like you said, she lived um, to be 90. Um, I think that's what you said earlier. Yes, she lived a very long life. Um, and so later on, um, she's involved, um, she's involved uh, with some um, legislation. So we have a question here from um, from Ralph. Um, he said, uh, Mary Church Terrell won an important Supreme Court decision against segregation in DC restaurants yes, later in yes. her life. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that for our audience? Because we, we don't get into it because we see, we see her a little bit younger yeah. in your portrayal. Right. Uh, very good question. Uh, there's a book about that too called Another Southern Town. Um, Mary Church Terrell and the Struggle for Racial Justice in the Nation's Capital by Joan Quigley. Um, yes, yeah, she, she knew that there was a very obscure law on the books that said that you could not deny admission to persons of color or something to that effect if they were well behaved or something <laughs> diminishing like that, but it, it was a law. And so uh, she got dressed up and got a three of her friends and went to, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but they went to the restaurant explicitly to test the, that law. So they got asked to leave. And I think they um, got witnesses to, you know, to say that that had happened and they, they filed a lawsuit and uh, they won. And she was successful in desegregating Washington. She also picketed in front of many, 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 uh, it, businesses that were discriminating. There's a beautiful picture, I think I, I sent that one too, of her in her 80s with her fur coat and her hat. Oh, I didn't send that one. Uh, her fur, well, it's in the in the film at the very end where she says we, we're second class citizens because we don't stand up for ourselves. She's got on her fur coat and her hat and her pearls and her picket sign in front of Kresge's. And she's saying, don't shop at Kresge's because they discriminate against colored people. Uh, so she didn't stop with that lawsuit. Uh, she, while, while it was in court, they were picketing. They were on the picket line. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have that image, but as you referenced, okay. you can see it at the end of the at the end of the performance, and I, I saw it, and it's it's a really amazing photo of her. Um, you know, her later work leads me to um, a question that I had I posed to her. So, Ter to, to you, excuse me, um, Terrell and some of her contemporaries different on policies and tactics um, around activism, the same way we see today. Yes. Um, what, you know, what do you think activists today can learn from Terrell? And what do you think her thoughts would be about the current Black Lives Matter movement? Very interesting question. Um, and, uh, which makes me think of her relationship with Ida B. Wells, who was her contemporary, and they sort of had that same dispute about how to go about things. Ida was much more militant and in your face about things uh, than, than Mary was. Mary was very diplomatic. Um, she was outspoken and plain spoken, but she was more diplomatic. Um, and more, and again, she saw herself as this liaison trying to, to create interracial understanding through, through getting to know each other and working together. Whereas uh, uh, Ida was more, more demanding, I guess, I guess is a word you could use. But um, I think there's room at, at the table for everyone's approach. Um, uh, I was just listening to uh, uh, saying that this is a moment where you can chastise, enlighten, and encourage. And I think she did all three. Um, she would absolutely be active now. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking of her activism in the um, um, protesting against the peonage uh, convict lease system in Georgia. Fast forward and we have the, you know, the, the mass incarceration hasn't changed all the way back then she was addressing that um she uh was very active of talking about lynching and police brutality fast forward um same issues uh and this one really uh was interesting to me to find out that in the 20s the daughters of the confederate daughters of the confederacy wanted to put a a statue in commemoration of mammies in Washington, D.C. They wanted to put a, a mammy statue in Washington, D.C. And of course, the, <laughs> the African-American community was having none of it. Uh, and so she wrote about that and how disastrous that was and, and how delusional it was to think that just because you had affection for a slave woman that raised you doesn't mean that she was loyal to you out of love and there was more, it was more complicated than that, that mammies had their own children taken from them and sold, that, that they had no control over their life, that they had no control over who fathered their own children. And it was not honoring them by building the statue saying that they were loyal slaves. And so it's really just, you fast forward and it's the same issues. It's statues, it's, it's incarceration, it's, uh, um, uh, the laws that are still, the ERA still hasn't been ratified. Um, so it, she was on the battlefield all that time and it's time for us to pick up the torch and keep going. Thank you. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, we had a, a question here from um, one of our participants about the setting where you filmed. Oh, um, yeah. And I know you wanted to also give a, a shout out. Can you tell us yes. more about your backdrop? They asked specifically, um, is the furniture in the background period pieces? Um, if so, where did you get it? And that was from Rebecca. So do you wanna talk about where you, where you filmed? Yes, we were so blessed. Um, I had done a, a program at Lake Erie College in, Cle uh, in Painesville, Ohio. And Dr. Catherine Delavan, a, a professor there, had invited me to do a, a suffrage program there. And they have a guest house there. And it was so beautiful. I thought this would be a great setting because it is an historic house. A, a doctor that lived in um, Painesville had lived in that house. And so it's most of the furniture is the original furniture. It's uh, over a hundred years old. And um, they were gracious enough to allow us to, to uh, do our um, video shoot there. 
So that, that is how the, the house actually looks. It's there on the campus of Lake Erie College. And uh, Catherine and Deborah and uh, Catherine, Basil, then um, Deb, they all very graciously arranged for me to come because the campus is closed because of COVID-19. And so they didn't have to do that. And so that, but it just made such a lovely setting for, uh, for her to do that because she has, a, her, Mary Church Terrell actually lived in a beautiful home uh, first in uh, in Washington D.C. that is a national landmark now, but it's it's gutted now. You know, none of the interiors there. But she also, when she died, she lived in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, and I don't know if that house is still in existence or uh, yeah, I, sure. I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah, but I'm sure she had a lovely home, so that that made it that made it even more uh, realistic for me. Thank you. Uh, so I have two more questions as we uh, start to wrap up our conversation. Okay. Um, so we have a question from uh, Sandy. Uh, she asked, um, as you did your research, did you come across any of Mrs. Terrell's thoughts or ideas that were that either seemed ahead of their time or seemed old fashioned? Yes, yes. Um, she said from a very young age, she felt that uh, a, a woman should be in charge of her own life. And that struck me. Um, and um, one of the books I read, the, the author uh, posited that that might be because her mother, after they got divorced, well, even before that, when her parents first married, her mother was a, a hairdresser and had a uh, hair salon. And she was the one that bought the house and the carriage from her, her income before Mr. Terrell's businesses got off the ground. And he went on to become the first millionaire in, in the South. Uh, um, and, and uh, became a millionaire from his real estate holdings and, and businesses that he had. But she was the one that, that had the nest egg. And so I think from her mother being independent and getting divorced, and, and then she, when they got divorced, she moved to New York City and had another a very successful hair salon um, that had a very exclusive clientele. And so I think she might have seen from that what independent women could do. Um, and again, when she was in school, she said she realized as a colored girl, people didn't expect much from her and she wanted to prove them wrong. She wanted to do her best at everything and excel at everything so that nobody could say, she always wanted to be the best representation of, of colored womanhood that she could be. And so I was struck by that. Um, when she decided to go to college, she said she wanted to take the gentleman's course and not the ladies course. And when she said that, her friends were like, what are you going to do that for? You know, that's, it, that's so hard. You're going to have to learn Greek. And where are you going to find a colored man that speaks Greek? <laughs> and it just so happened that Robert Herberton Terrell spoke Greek, her husband. Uh, and they made a, a great match together. And, oh, and I wanted to correct that I said in the uh, video that he graduated from uh, Harvard Law uh, from Harvard Law School. He did not. He graduated from Harvard undergraduate in 1884 and then graduated from Howard University Law School. Uh, so I reversed it. But um, she didn't care that that wasn't something that, you know, a colored girl was supposed to do or that a woman was supposed to do. That was too much education and it would make it hard for her to find a husband. And uh, what would she do with all of that anyway? And then the second thing that I really touched me was uh, in her book, she recounts how the first time she told Robert, when they were still just colleagues teaching school in Washington, she told him that she stood up at a suffrage meeting and said that she believed in suffrage. And he laughed and said that she would have a hard time finding a husband. And she told him she would never be foolish enough to marry a man who didn't think that a woman should participate in the government that, you know, and, and uh, she didn't know that he was a suffragist at the time. Uh, but she didn't care. And I just, I just admired that spunk in her. And she was determined to be who she was. Yeah, I really appreciate, you know, you comment about how she, she doesn't really give, she doesn't really think about, you know, marriage and, and, and the implications being married will have on her and the expectations mm. of what that means for her and how she's sort of relieved when she doesn't have to uh, run her, 
her father's house. And mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting and certainly to the you know question of progressive ideas. I think mm -hmm. that that's incredibly progressive for the time period that yes, she is, was. that she's yeah. living in. Um, so we do have one last question for you, um, and there's some similar ones. This came up quite a few times in the chat as well. Um, but what do you hope people remember about Terrell as a, as a result um, of your performance and our conversation today? I hope they remember that she was very committed to equality. Uh, that was what was important to her from the time she was a child. She said she couldn't stand for people to tease people because they had some kind of uh, disability or, or for the, their race or any reason. She felt everyone should be treated with dignity. And she felt that um, it was our duty to use whatever gifts we have to help other people that might, uh, that she felt that uh, it was our, our duty to, to uplift those around us. Their, their motto of the National Association of, National Association of Colored Women is lifting as we climb. And she felt that was a very important, you just don't climb to the top and say, well, I've arrived. You lift other people up with you. You lift them up with you. And if they're, if something that you can address in solidarity with someone who's being mistreated, you should do that. Thank you so much, Sherry. I appreciate your time and your wonderful performance. Thank um, you. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. You can uh, watch um, you can watch Sherry's performance as Mary Church Terrell at mdchautauqua.org. And we hope you'll join us next week, um, which will be our last Chautauqua. Um, and we will be we'll be joined by one of the most powerful voices of the Civil and Voting Rights Act in the South, SNCC organizer, Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yes, me too. <laughs> so thank you everyone again for joining us. Take care. And we hope to see you back next week. Thank you.